Hi, I'm Peter Rostro with the Aberdeen Group, Research Director for Sales Effectiveness. When I'm asked about CRM integration of sales training content, that's really a very complex question. Why? Because we know that traditionally sales organizations are populated by a lot of different types of personalities, many of whom are not necessarily as inclined as we would like to enter information into the CRM or SFA tool, uh, maybe holding some of their contacts and information a little bit close to the vest, uh, under the belief that most of the reason why that information needs to be entered or the system used, frankly, it's just because the folks at the top of the food chain need to know more about what's going on. However, our research shows that the best-in-class companies within the sales training world actually integrate sales training content and modules right into the CRM instance. Much as salespeople for these top performing companies are able to click on various tabs to do their own email marketing campaigns throughout their own customer base, or let's say go to an electronics uh, contract tool or a configure price quote instance, or perhaps look up new information about their people, companies, and industries, uh, we know that putting sales training content right there in the interface that the folks are using in the sales organization is very effective. We also know that the companies with higher levels of CRM adoption also use more sales training content and as a result end up with more folks hitting quota and seeing their revenue grow faster on a year-over-year -year basis. Before we get into the topic for today, and I give you some context for it and introduce our guests, I wanted to just do a very, some brief housekeeping with you. I know most of you are, by this stage, very familiar with Zoom, so I'm not going to go through that. Other than just say, in terms of interaction today, if you have questions, please just use the chat function. I will not be checking the Q&A function in Zoom. Just put them into chat and I will be monitoring that as we go through this afternoon. Uh, in terms of your, uh, how you organize it, would suggest you use the gallery view. If you want to turn off those videos for any reason, the simplest way to do it is just to use the full screen at the top right hand corner. There's a little square. Hit that and then you're able to move the videos of the participants around. Other than that, I think we're ready to go. In terms of context and the reason why we're even having this in the first place was, I have to be honest, when I came across Gong first, and by the way, I have to say, this is not a sponsored webinar by Gong. When I initially launched this, they didn't even know we were doing this. So the reason why I, I, I did it, I, I'll explain, is that I had come across Gong in the past, was a little bit skeptical at some of the claims that people were making. And then I was doing some work with a company late last year, earlier this year, before the lockdown, and I would go in there once a week, a couple of hours, and saw how those guys were using Gong, not just for the basics, but really was, when I went in there every week, they would say to me, and Paul, we're going to implement that in Gong. And I was kind of thinking, how do you, what do you mean implement this in Gong? It didn't even make sense until it was explained how they were using Gong to tie in what we were doing from a training point of view into the on-the-job performance. And really what that meant to them was, how do you implement long-term behavioral change? Because that has always been the big billion-dollar question when it comes to sales training is that people come into a room and they're energized and they go out. But after a few weeks, people tend to go back to their old habits again. So how are they using this particular technology to address that specific problem? And so that's where this webinar started. I was curious to know more and to share that with other people as well. And it's kind of grown legs from there. So I thought we'd use this as a platform to introduce people to the technology if you're looking at it, but really more for those who are using it and who wanted to get more out of it. So with that in mind, I wanted to introduce our special guest today. So the first person um, is, is, is Killian O'Grady. Killian is a senior sales director with Sprout Social. 
Killian I've known for many years. Uh, anybody I've ever spoken to, and there's been many who've ever been managed by Killian will always say the same thing. Best manager I ever had. He is a phenomenal coach. And so it won't surprise you to hear that he has a lot of experience in using Gong as a coaching tool and to take that behavioral change that's addressed through training using coaching supported by Gong into the field. Uh, my other guest is Tom Castley. Tom Castley is VP of Sales with Outreach. Again, I've known Tom for years. Tom, a, another phenomenal manager, superb communicator, wonderful storyteller. Uh, one last thing before I open it up and we kick it off formally is questions. I have a number of questions which I'm going to put to both Killian and Tom. And some of you have been gracious enough to send in your questions. I've got lots of them. So I'm going to address those at the end. If you have questions as we go through this, please pop those into the chat and I'll also add them into the mix at the end. I can't promise we'll get to every one of them because we already have a lot but uh, we, we will certainly do our best. Actually, do you know, guys, I'm just curious, before I ask you the first question, I was curious to know from the people we have online right now, how many of them are existing users and how many of them are looking at it. Just from a point of view of a language, it might help all of us if we knew, because if everybody's an existing user, then they'll understand some of the language. If not, uh, maybe not so. I'm just going to throw up a quick poll. If people could... Just take that online. So, so there's a, a number of questions. So, well, sorry, one question. What is your current status as a Gong user? Extensive? You've got it, but you don't really use it a lot. You somewhat uh, know, but you're considering it. And then the last one is, no, you're not really that familiar with it at all. So what we've got there is actually a small percentage are using it extensively, 25% somewhat. I'm going to end that poll in a second and then share the results. So get your... I'm going to end it and then I'm sharing the results. So you can see them there, folks, um, quite surprisingly. So 29% are somewhat using it and 5% extensively. My gut feel was when we started this, that was the audience we were addressing, those who were using it but felt they could get a lot more out of it. And then, of course, if anybody else is considering it, I guess you'll have questions. You can jump in with those as well. So if we're ready, folks, I, I wanted to uh, address my first question which was, if you could, and I'll go to you, Tom, first, is when you came across Gong first, I don't know if it was in, your, in outreach in your current uh, role, but what was the problem that you were trying to address initially? Yeah, so it wasn't a problem so much as I was introduced to conversational intelligence um, when I joined outreach and hadn't had it before. So my experience was kind of the revelation of uh, how on earth have I managed without this previously. So prior to outreach, my experience was uh, either using kind of judgment-based data. Mm -hmm. So speaking to the reps, asking them how they did, how they thought the call went, mm -hmm. looking at the outcome of the call, which of course um, – can be a great outcome even with uh, a terribly run call because that person's just despite the salesperson still wants to buy that technology or process or service and uh, the third was just you know live listening into calls or doing ride-alongs you know from the from the old days when we used to be able to go out and visit people so you know my experience was the revelation of being able to you know to dip in and out of just the sheer volume of calls and then it's, I'm sure as we come on to other questions, you'll ask, right, okay, so how do you, how do you put some structure to that? Because just because you've recorded every single call, um, now what do you do with it? So for you initially, it was really about efficiency. It was about trying to, how do I take this large bucket of calls and efficiently mm. take out of it what, what, what I need to, or where I need to invest my time? How, how can we have an impact? Yes. All right. Killian, perhaps I could ask the same question to you in terms of what problem you were trying to solve uh, with Gong initially. Yeah, I think I think the key thing was, um, I suppose, the challenge of being able to get a real handle on what's happening live with customers. Um, you know, there's only a certain, certain amount of calls you can sit in live and join live with. Uh, so across a global sales force, it was very challenging for us to know what we were doing well, uh, right. what wasn't going so well. 
Uh, and Gong really helped us uh, get that picture at a very high level, but also at a very granular level. So that was probably one of the challenges we were trying to address. Um, plus, we were looking for something uh, that integrated well with our CRM system, um, and it tied in nicely with that. I, and I would suspect that most people, when they start using call recording, which people would regard it as, as at its most basic level, that's what they're looking for. They're looking for ways, efficient ways of capturing that data in, and interrogating it in some way. But I wanted to move on then to, because I, I think most people get that, more about some of the more innovative ways that people are using it. And Killian, I'm going to address this question to you first, which is to how you use it for taking on the job training that your reps are getting and tying that in then to their performance? How, how did they take that learning and implement it in, the, in, in their calls? Sure, um, so I think, I mean, I don't think it's probably a huge secret that you were referring to working with, with ourselves uh, when you were talking in your introduction. I just didn't want, I didn't know whether you wanted to admit to that, Killy. that's all um, I'm saying. We have used John occasion, Paul, thank you. Um, but I think the key thing for us was that we were on a weekly basis tackling a particular sander, in this case topic, but it could have been any sales training topic. Uh, and we wanted to make sure that people were using and practicing that technique or skill or whatever it is they were learning. Uh, so we were very specifically trying to measure that within Gong and looking for evidence of it and giving people the opportunity to practice it. Um, so for example, if it was an upfront contract, uh, we would set up a tracker in Gong to report back on the use of upfront contracts. So every time an upfront contract was used, uh, we'd get a notification. Uh, and then what I was doing was having um, a peer-to-peer -peer Gong coaching review session, uh, which we also use Gong to do. So we would take two or three calls on a weekly basis. We'd have every salesperson listen to them um, and give feedback within Gong in terms of what they thought went well and what didn't. Uh, and then we'd, we'd run a one-hour session where everybody would share that feedback. And we found that it was a very positive reinforcement. Uh, because we would pick calls specifically, and let's say it was we were evaluating how well we were using upfront contracts, we would focus that gong review session specifically on upfront contracts. Now, you, you, you've had that training in other organizations without gong, and now you're using the gong technology. What, what difference are you seeing in terms of uptake on concepts that they're learning in the classroom? Um, I, th I think one of the things is that uh, certainly, looking back at a previous life, people had a very, I mean, if people were reporting back, for example, how they how they performed or how they did, um, it was basically from their lens of how they thought they did. And obviously on a sales call, you've got to be in the moment with your customer. You can't really also be analyzing, you know, how you're performing and whether it's going as well. Um, having another pair of eyes on the call, you know, as, as Tom referred to write-ons, etc. cetera, um, you can obviously, somebody else would see something that you don't see. I think having that record uh, of a call is really, really powerful for multiple people to listen back to, uh, to discuss, to refine. Uh, and one of the very powerful things we found is that you know over time we could track better usage, more usage of particular techniques, uh, but also for reps to see the impact it had. Um, you know, so that it was, you know, how did the customer react when you said X, Y, or Z? Okay, interesting. What about you, Tom? Uh, have you experienced anything like that in your world? Uh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, so everything uh, Killian said, and I'm now kicking myself that we don't use trackers a little bit more. Um, as as with all of these technologies, I think um, you, know, you kind of focus on the bits that have impact for you, and there's always a plethora of capability that we don't get around to using. So. Now, first things first for me, given the audience, uh, address the elephant in the room, which is we're recording calls. And uh, and which calls do we record? Uh, we record everything. So we record our SDR calls. So the cold calls that go out, which might be just a 30-second advert or three or four minutes or 20 minutes sometimes. We record all of the Zoom calls that our IEs do. And we also record all of the Zoom calls our customer success people do. And I had to overcome um, a bit of a cross the chasm moment for myself. I remember uh, having a, an honest call, which was, um, you know, do we mention the fact that these calls are recorded when they're the one minute calls? Of course, it's the law. You have to. And I had, you know, 
coming not from that background, I had that huge fear that if we told somebody it was recorded, it was difficult enough to get a connect as it was without somebody slamming down the phone. And I can tell you uh, across thousands of calls now, our script is, hi, this is Tom Castley calling from Outreach on a recorded line. You know, it's a sales call and go through the usual Sandler script. And we've never had one person object to that or even refer back to it. At all. Most of, uh, the most common one is actually somebody saying, are you about to Sandler me? <laughs> in, in which case the reps will go, yes, I am. At least you know it's going to be a good call that won't waste your time. And we'll only be two or three minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and what it's interesting, as you say that, I've not yeah. received one of those calls. So this is the first time I'm hearing it this way. Yeah. And what strikes me is that uh, it, it sounds like a bit of a pattern without getting into details. Mm. But the other thing is that if you're recording me in a line, you're not going to be rude to me. <laughs> you know? No. Which, which is interesting because that's one of people's biggest fears is that somebody's going to be rude to them and, you know, where did you get my number from or whatever. <laughs> so I've never, I've never thought of that angle before, but it's an mm. interesting one. But, but, but what you're saying on a serious note is that it, that was really head trash for you and that it has not oh, impacted it, calls at yeah, all. Yeah, it just hasn't. No, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. And so, about, so, sorry, go on. Yeah, so we use uh, call reviews in three lenses. So one is uh, we have uh, everybody reviews their own calls. And um, I give you a reason why. I, and I get frustrated on some webinars where people never give away their like golden nuggets, their gifts. Mm -hmm. So here's a gift for you. Uh, super powerful across the SDR and the A um, environment. Listen back to a call you will undoubtedly as a rep hear things that you didn't pick up on first time round, which are absolute gold dust. You're kicking yourself that you didn't take that down the pain funnel or address it. I challenge you. So listen back to the call, find the top three things and write an email back to the prospect saying something along the lines of, I have reviewed this call in detail. Having gone back over it, my fault totally missed a couple of things that sounded like they were important. Uh, one is, can you confirm, are they? And two is, if they are, more than happy to have another call digging into that and seeing if there's anything we can do that's worthwhile addressing. The level of buying and engagement from a prospect when you do that is just off the charts. So if only for one reason, take away that tip from here. Uh, we just found, you just go to column A straight away in terms of the, the buyer's perception of the potential value you might be able to deliver. There's so, so much one is, that though as well because yeah. you think about it, you're, you're, you're developing the rep's sense of self-awareness as well mm. because when they go back and every time they discover that there's something they left out, they, they get better and better at that and, and each call that goes on, there's less and less left out as well. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. What about you, Kenny? Uh, is that something that you've uh, looked at? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the call recording side of it is, is, is really powerful. And I mean, one of the things we do very proactively with customers is actually share the recordings with them or mm. part of the recordings. Because also yeah. the customer, you know, is seeing our technology for the first time, um, may need to share it with other people, try and explain it to other people. And having a live demo from an expert, if it's a demonstration, for example, is really, really powerful. So mm. uh, they find that fantastic. Um, and also we call out, you know, that... By the fact that we are recording the call that um it, it leaves us free not to have to take notes you know and we can really be with the customer in the moment you know if there's complex questions they're asking we can listen back and get the details and pass it on you know even for from our product development teams they have tra tra trackers set up you know so on the specific requests coming in that's one of the, the use cases we have for gone you know if people are requesting certain features all the time we can quantify um but also, um, you know, have our product engineering teams listen to specifically what the customers are asking for. So it's giving our whole organization access to what our customers are saying to us. Yeah. Tom, I'm sorry. I, I think you were about to say something, and I, I think I could have crossed you there with that last question. That's right. Yeah, so I was just saying, so you have the individuals listening back to themselves. Somebody put a, a comment in the question, what do top reps do? Well, the gong data will show you that top reps listen back to their own calls and perform 6% better uh, than other reps. The second area for us, exactly the same as Killian, we do a lot of peer reviewing. Uh, I don't scale. Uh, if we can teach our reps to coach each other, 
um, then uh, we effectively make our, make them into disciples of sales effectively. And we use uh, scorecards for that. So I'm a big fan of coaching to the process, not to the outcomes. So making sure they frequently do certain things during the call. And we've signposted those and they'll be scored for, uh, one is, did they kind of mention it? Uh, number two is, did it feel scripted? So different levels. Uh, was it in their own words or did it just happen as part of the conversation? So there's different level of capability in each of those areas. And then the third is, is um, you know, we will run sessions during the week where a rep can bring their call. We always like them to bring a good call um, rather than the bad one. And then we go through the good call and, and why they're happy with it, why they're proud of it and uh, and what that does for them. So, um, yeah, so unlike Killian, we, I, I'm not sure that we're using as many trackers, but we are using a lot of these uh, scorecards, which are then great for onboarding new reps. I have another question for you. So in terms of onboarding, how are you using it? Tom, I'll talk to you first. Yeah. So uh, look, I've, uh, I've brought on 18 people during lockdown and they're all remote. And, um, you know, the way this was done before was some classroom training and, uh, you know, go on a ride along with somebody and you might do three meetings in a week. I can have somebody in the first week of onboarding listen to close to 50 or 60 calls and to provide commentary and coaching notes back in terms of their perspective of where they came from. Because actual fact, we hire really good people not to be clones of the ones we've already got, but to actually add value and have their own way of thinking. So see some of their coaching is really powerful for our reps. Mm. They can listen to anybody across the globe and such variety of calls at different stages during the sales cycle. So from an onboarding standpoint, uh, yeah, really useful in terms of giving people a breadth of experience of what it's like to talk to customers and what they're about. And through the tagging on calls, we can say, look, go and listen to, uh, you know, 15 compete calls where, you know, it might be us replacing another piece of technology. Go and listen to a bunch where you're talking to CROs or senior level people. Now go and listen to the ones which are talking to, you know, RevOps or Rio, Revenue Excellence and Operations. Yeah, a, a, a huge um, upgrade to what it was like, you know, in previous life when I didn't have this technology. Interesting. Killian, I know you brought on people as well in the last few months. Curious to know how you're using it to onboard. Your sure. Ex. I mean, it's always been a very integral part of our onboarding, even when we were doing in-class trainings. Uh, because as Tom said, it's you know it's an incredible way. I mean, it's one thing doing role plays in class, but to actually hear real live customer examples uh, of you know what your future role is going to be is so powerful. Um, you know, be it how we position certain products or solutions, how we talk to certain buyer personas, uh, it's all there. Uh, we also use it like the scorecarding part as part of our certification process for new hires, so that. Again, the future hires can hear what the gold standard of a new hire would sound like. Mm. Um, but there's a lot of practice, a lot of support. It's a very, very powerful tool from that perspective. Super. So next question I have for you is, okay, is this, this is an interesting one. This came in earlier today is, how do you use it to establish a common sales language? Yeah, I'm, yes, I'm happy sorry, to take that <laughs> yeah. My bad, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Tom, I'll start with you first. Yeah, so um, look, you know, one of the themes on here is, uh, you know, it's taking stuff out of the classroom and, and putting it into practice. And um, the common sales language is, for me, more so, uh, more important at the beginning of any call as opposed to, you know, as you kind of get into the conversation, it's then more art than science. But if you don't start the call up properly, and if you're not looking for uh, certain traits, then uh, this is where you just get this like infinitesimal uh, outcomes of different meetings. So common sales language for us in our sales cycle, so we have a typically about a 65 day sales cycle. I need people to be uh, very specific at the beginning of the call as we had in the tape up front is you know, this is their meeting, but they need to be warned that there's stuff that's coming up that we want to address as well. And uh, for us is uh, we talk about internally the next next. 
So not just what the next step is, but if that one went well as well, then the next step after that would be this. Um, I always think of, uh, I always like to have people two steps ahead, but it's being able to, that, that common sales language will then say, right, so did you set the call up at the beginning, upfront contract? Uh, did you do next steps at the beginning? Because it's on Zoom in particular, it's always rushed at the end. You get, ah, oh, I've got my next call. I've got 30 seconds. So we always do the next steps right at the beginning. And, uh, and then the third is, at the moment, is I'm pushing everybody um, to keep looking at at least second level pains on those first, first calls, at first 30 minutes. Sometimes they don't get into second level pains. So for everybody who's not experienced with Sandler, that's the financial impact of anything that's brought up. And then it may have a financial input, but actually impact, but is it actually important for them to address in the current climate or given their current role or aspirations? What about you, Killeen? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I mean, again, obviously, we're, we're trying to use some of the, I wouldn't say scripts, but some of the terminology that, mm. you know, for example, learned in Sander. Uh, one of the interesting things in terms of language we've used is we've, and this wouldn't be me now, but some of the, the admins of the Gong system have analysed our success by using certain, literally by using certain language. Uh, and for example, we've discovered that, you know, we acquired a company a number of years ago which we're extremely proud of the technology that we acquired and that we've now built into our platform. But we found that mentioning that company's name on calls reduced our propensity to sell successfully. So for example, we nice. removed that from our language. So that's the sort of insights we can get from the tool. Um, also, you know, just basic things like um, filler words people use are made more consciously aware of. Um, as one of the DEI leaders within the company, you know, we measure, you know, if there's any language that may not be DEI appropriate. So there's, there's other language other than pure sales language that we do look at. But it's, um, you know, I can see it on the peer reviews and the gong reviews that, um, you know, people are starting to say, I love the way that person says this. Um, you know, we, we try and look at how we, you know, if something's working, sounds good. People are adopting the language of other people and it gives more consistency across the business. Mm -hmm. And simple things like what is our value proposition? How do we uh, differentiate us from our competitors? Is that consistent across the company? Mm -hmm. You know, when our customer success people speak to clients, do they get the same experience that they would with a, an AE, et cetera? Yeah, that's really interesting as well. I, I would never have thought of that. I was, I was looking at this from a common language so that when we say something says 60% close, we understand what that means or we understand what an upfront contract is. We all have a shared understanding. I'd never thought of about removing language uh, and also like as and fillers as well, but certainly removing language. Uh, even if something is common, it doesn't have to be a DEI. Like you're saying, it could be just buzzwords that people are using that might confuse somebody or make them a little not okay. Uh, that that's that's quite powerful in itself. Absolutely, I mean it, it really does help us um, just become more mindful and more aware of what we say and how it impacts people. Yeah, I, I, the, the next question I have for you guys, I think we've covered somewhat, but I think it's worth revisiting a little, it, which is around the area of coaching, how you're using it specifically for coaching certain behaviors. Maybe you could talk it through that kind of workflow process whether you do it all internally whether you use it externally outside the organization etc killing if i could throw that one to you first please sure um i mean obviously one of the the tabs within the system includes coaching um, and one of the things I, I really like about this is how it benchmarks different people in the team and different elements of their calls so for example you know their their question rates um their patience on calls um, and we obviously get benchmarks in terms of best practice so people can measure themselves against, but also identify who are the people, who are the go-to people, who's really good at asking questions, who's really good at the various techniques, be it up front contracts or negotiation. Um, so for the first time, it's, it's, it's not just looking at who's got the best results in the company, you know, for particular behavior areas. So we can match people and pair people up who've got a real skill in a particular area. Um, so that's clearly one of the ways we use on coaching. And obviously, to, to the point of the scorecards, if we're measuring people over time in terms of how we measure and score uh, calls on a consistent basis, um, it also helps managers be consistent across the organization as well as uh, the coaching experience ha people have. We haven't really used um, coaching in any external fashion. 
and it probably does relate to GDPR issues, but it said it's it's internally we uh, we do use it a lot. Yeah, Tom. Yeah, so um, my saying here is, so frequencies times competencies equals results. So doing more of the right things, frequencies, and doing them more often, and then doing them really well. Uh, drives phenomenal results. So, you know, Gong doesn't track all of my frequencies. Those frequencies might be, you know, sending certain types of emails, interacting with certain individuals. Um, but what Gong certainly does is help us to score competencies. So, you know, competencies which are important to us is, you know, authentic listening, is, is asking great questions, uh, is... Um, uh, is set the tone of the meeting where everybody feels included, you know, meeting management, so on and so forth. So it allows me, uh, you know, whereas before in coaching, when you didn't have deep insight into what was going on, all you could do is just crack the whip and basically say, look, just do everything, do more of everything and do do more of it, work longer hours and do it quicker, was basically the, the two-dimensional approach <laughs> to coaching. And then, you know, if we're fortunate enough to have some regular training, hope that that sticks. And this is the competency side of management. What I would say is, uh, and you know, I, I've, I've also heard of um, you know, Killian's reputation over the years as well, um, in terms of being a phenomenal coach and manager. Um, when you get a tool like this in place, uh, it will it kind of forces managers to move out of that realm, which is a very popular place to go, which is let me help. Let me show you how I did this when I was an amazing rep, which is the clone based management, which also doesn't scale, but you kind of have to then move into, let me help you to do it your way. And let's share the touch of genius that comes from lots of people on an infrequent basis across the team, which will then just explode performance. So, um, I actually think it, it helps mediocre managers become great uh, because they also get to see what's going on a little bit better in their organization. It's actually a really exciting time. We've never had this much kind of telemetry level data in sales, which one requires us to become coaches, but also actually helps support and identifies those that do it. Curious to know how much the lockdown, to whatever extent people are experiencing that, has accelerated what you've just talked about, Tom, where you're now forced to, you, you, you yeah, can't just so, jump onto somebody's desk or jump into their call the way you used to be able to. Yeah, so um, yeah, the old lazy sales and management was, you know, do some ride alongs, you know, go out for some meals with some customers and then do a forecast call on a Friday uh, and hope that your reps weren't spinning you a yarn and that you could tell when they were, you know, telling you a fib. Um, yeah, you don't have that luxury anymore. So, um, so in actual fact, for me, I'm incredibly excited about the potential that what we have been through creates for the sales uh, area as a whole. What you know, one is is you know decentralizing employee bases. I have an office in London. Previously, I would have hired all of my SDRs in London. Well, now you know, oh, brain shock. Uh, some of my SDRs are phenomenally productive working from home. Who would have ever thought that somebody really early on in their career would excel at home? <laughs> yeah, so now actually I could hire them from anywhere. Yep. Uh, so, you know, because then funny enough, there might be some really good reps up in the North of England who I was not even considering before or anywhere else for that matter. Hmm. Um, All those Leeds fans who are super excited now. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, but yeah, the, the um, a lot of organizations have had to grow up with regards to this technology very quickly. And, um, you know, I would say that there's a number of organizations who are going like, wow, how on earth did we not know about this before? Yeah. 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 Killian, for you, what role has it played? Because you now have been working from home under lockdown since what, probably mid-March, like everybody else, in terms of how beneficial it's been to you in managing your team. Sure. I mean, one of the, the ironic things is that my routine every day now is I go out for a walk um, and I was never one for listening to music, walking or particularly the radio. So I listen to gong calls in the morning. Uh, so I'm accompanied on my journey by my team. 
which is uh, great fun, listening to their voices early in the morning. Uh, but it means that I get into the habit every morning of listening to calls. It gives me a sense of what's happened the previous day. Um, so, you know, how things are shaping and moving. Uh, and I begin to see trends because I'm listening to so many calls and beginning to see trends of, you know, how the industry is changing, how the market's changing. Um, and we can certainly see patterns as we've gone through the pandemic. So I, I have to say uh, it's been really uh, it's good to have a, a solid connection with people. And as Tom said, you, you can't just sidle over to their desk anymore or listen in as, as you're passing by. Um, so I do that every morning. But then also, you know, I'm looking at the triggers that have been set up and that notify me of particularly good things that happen in, in various calls. Yeah. Uh, last question before we move on to the questions that have been sent in over the call, which was how you use the technology to identify training gaps. I'm going to assume that this is output of the coaching calls, and I just wonder if there's anything you can add to that to say how we identify specific training needs from, the, from that technology. Uh, Killian, let's start with you first, please. Yeah, I mean, so one of the, it's not just training needs, but also the impact of training and coaching as it goes along. So, you know, at the back end, our um, analysts are doing a lot of work on a, on a much broader scope than me just listening to you know, specific calls within my team. And we very much identify areas where there's a perceived weakness and maybe in how we position a value proposition or we're getting stuck regularly in a particular part of the sales cycle. Uh, so that breeds the next requirement for ongoing training. So, um, you know, we would regularly decide. It gives us the prioritization, I suppose, in terms of where we need to invest in further training. All right, good stuff. So let's uh, take some of the questions, if you don't mind, guys, that, that have come in while we've been on the call. Uh, the, uh, one question, actually, which is I've never heard of Gong, what is it? Um, how would you describe that in a sentence other than it's a piece of technology? What, what would you say to people, Tom, if you're, if you're describing what it is and somebody had never heard of it? Yeah, conversational intelligence. It effectively records calls um, and creates a transcription of that, which can then be analyzed and dug into after the fact. Okay, that sounds pretty uh, pretty uh, specific. I, I, that's exactly what it is. So, all right, so that, that was for John who threw that question in. Uh, so here was a few that came in earlier. Now, I know we're not going to get to all of these in the time that we had, so... Uh, I think the first one, how are the best reps using data for peer coaching? Tom, you addressed that one. You said you have, well, you have them review their own calls. Do you do any peer, do they do any peer coaching amongst one another? They do. So that's the majority of the coaching actually. So the, the reason we implemented scorecards is to get away from the I feel or I like type coaching. Uh, which is judgment based, which, you know, when you've got as much experience as Killian or I, then we're allowed to do that every now and again. But if you're actually any good at coaching, you still don't do it. Uh, you coach to a process um, and you're looking for certain attributes and traits to be in place. So we use the scorecards for that. Right. Um, Tom, there's another question for you there that came in. Uh, and after losing it, bear with me a second. It was, and I don't understand what this term means, so I'm going to throw it out to you. Can outreach, is it K A I A? How do you pronounce that? Kaya. Kaya, okay. Yeah. It says knowledge AI, AI assistance. Yeah. So, so <laughs> yeah. tell us what that is. Here's right. your platform. So, yeah. <laughs> wow, okay. Well, if you asked our customers, no, it hasn't been released yet, so uh, you can't ask our customers yet. So we talked about a few months ago a new product called Outreach Kaya. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the difference between conversational intelligence and, and outreach Kaya is that conversational intelligence's uh, job in life is to record and transcribe a call, which you would then have access to maybe 15, 20 minutes afterwards uh, to be able to look at and to work through. Um, Kaya will be unique in that it's real time. So if you imagine where the chat window is to the right of Zoom at the moment, Outreach Kaya would be sat there and would be transcribing the call in real time, which allows you to do a number of things. Uh, so the three best examples given to me by our beta customers, one is if somebody mentions a particular product feature or capability or asks a question about pricing, for example, it would pop a card which has the answer to those questions up. A bit like having your VP or your sales director with you on the call. The second would be, um, 
if somebody mentions somebody else on the meeting, it could go and look them up on LinkedIn for you. Again, present that information. Yeah. Or from a compliance standpoint, if somebody, if you're in financial services and you're mentioning a, um, a regulated product or service, uh, Kai would be able to do compliance in the moment to make sure that somebody appropriately trained was in the call. So it's, it, the summary of it is it's a bit like being able to have somebody like Killian in every single one of your calls rather than reviewing it after the fact. Oh, yeah, it's killing on every single call. Well, you, 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 do, your, you do your target in Q1. Yeah. yeah, well, it had to be in the morning, of course, whilst he's out on a walk. <laughs> <laughs> um, a question here was, I'm looking to understand better what Kong actually, okay, that's actually does it. By now, I think people should have a good insight into it. Secondly, how small size companies can utilize its services, if at all. So there's somebody, sounds like they have a concern that maybe it's only companies that are of medium to large size could actually use this. What, what, what say you to that, Killian? I mean, I mean, again, I'm not, I wasn't involved in procuring the software, so I have no idea how it's licensed or priced. Um, but, you know, if I was an individual running my own business, I don't see any reason why I couldn't use Gong myself. I mean, obviously, there's nobody going to appear going to be recording or reviewing me, but it's going to give me the same data as it would across a full team. So, okay. you know, I use Gong on my calls when I'm dealing with customers and I get great insights to help coach myself, but also I have my team coach me on how to be better. So, okay. So, if I, if you even have three or five people, it doesn't matter. It's, it's the insight you, 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 you yeah, take. I wouldn't, right. I wouldn't thought it would make any difference. Yeah, yeah. okay. Mm. Uh, I'm interested, there's another question. I'm interested how Gong could help to convince experienced, and that's in inverted commas, experienced sellers to recap and use the ground rules like asking the right questions, etc. Sometimes sellers think they use these ground rules, but maybe Gong supports in some dimensions to let them be motivated again to use these easy things. Now, I'm going to interpret that and, and what I think they're saying, tell me if I'm wrong, is that... Um, there seems to be a concern that maybe experienced sellers wouldn't use it, but if they did, how can it teach them? Tom, I think that's what you're doing. What you said is where you're getting people. <laughs> yeah, to I, their own I always. Uh, uh, here's here's the thing. Your best your best sellers will be the first people to grab this and to throttle every last bit of value out of it because they're best for a reason. Hmm. Your lucky sellers who may well go to club will not be very keen on using it because it will point out the fact that they are lucky. They're not good. Um, so anybody, <laughs> yeah, time, territory, talent, and target. Yeah, the four T's of selling. The good sellers are still ground out a result from a, from a territory in a given year that might not be that great. Lucky sellers can't. Lucky sellers don't like technology that identify that they are lucky. Yeah. I think lucky sellers, what they do, Tom, is when they, when they know they're lucky, they get out of it quickly and go into training. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You agreed a little bit too fast for me on that one. <laughs> I thought you were going in another direction. <laughs> so, so there's a few other questions here that are really good questions that I want to get to as well. Uh, are there companies using Gong during the interview process? Now, that's something we haven't talked about, and I thought that's an interesting one. And, and there's a, another question from the same same listener, and they've also said that that's, and I think it's the other side of that coin, which is about asking people to bring an example call to an interview. What, what, what do you think, Kitty, into that? So we, we haven't used Gong, as far as I'm aware, for interviews. Um, I mean, Gong is connected to our CRM, mm -hmm. uh, and obviously for data privacy reasons, we wouldn't have candidate information in our CRM system. Um, so that would be one of the main reasons that we wouldn't use it. I mean, it's an interesting idea yeah. um, to be able to analyze interviews, um, but we haven't, we haven't used it. Mm. I'm wondering though, could you, for example, if you knew a rep coming from another company where they were using a gong or a technology like gong, where you could say to them, bring some of your calls, you know, <laughs> bring your best calls. Is, is, yeah, is, mean, that, is, that, is, that, is that legal even? Well, one of the things we did, we have done, and I look after our solution engineering teams, and as part of a solution engineering interview process, uh, we do a product demonstration where we expect them to demonstrate a product that they're familiar with. Now, with their advance approval, which we always do have, we would typically record that. Um, and it's, it's again, it's, it's really to, sh to showcase to other people because 
when we're selecting solution engineers, we've got a, a global decision making unit who very seldom we can all get together on the one call. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the main purpose behind it, but we haven't really used the insights from it in terms of any decision making. It's an, it's an interesting idea, but not something we've done. Right. I think the next one is for you as well. I can't remember whether it was Tom or yourself, Kidding, and, and it was more of a statement by way of a question, which was, uh, I've never seen customer success use Gong. I can't remember what Tom was it. You were kidding. You mentioned customer yeah, we success. have our we yeah, have yeah. our customer success we have our customer success teams using it. And and, uh, and again, using it differently or is it? No, no. Again, uh, you know, to Killian's point, a lot of the time in customer success, we might be introducing a new feature, functional capability. We might be doing um, uh, a deep analysis on a new area that they're looking to get into, and we want to be able to share that with other parts of the business. Mm -hmm. This is about capturing the customer's voice and, you know, being able to do that at scale across the board is the most insightful way of actually understanding. You know, somebody said, so I, one of the questions was, you know, what, what's the future mm. of this? Yeah. So, you know, using a tool like outreach, we capture every call, every email, uh, every LinkedIn interaction and using something like Gong or other conversation intelligence tools, you capture every meeting as well. If you're capturing literally the words, the telemetry data that's coming from it. And down the line, you will see that um, people are starting to read that to, an, uh, to a level of being able to understand sentiment. So is it positive or negative? Yeah. Uh, why would you have sales stages anymore? The reason you have a sales stage is for a salesperson to make a judgment where they're at in the buyer's journey. If you're listening to the conversation, the conversation will tell you where you're at in the buyer's journey. I always like to have a look at where the buyer thinks they're at in the journey and where the seller thinks they're at in the journey. Rarely are they in the same place. Mm. Even we've been doing some exploring and some lab work uh, in outreach to find out, you know, when was, when did the buyer make the emotional purchase? Mm. You know, a lot of us appreciate people buy emotionally and justify it logically. So when was the emotional purchase made? When did they get it? Because mm. at that point, any discount is a giveaway. Yep. Or it's a it's a professional retreat uh, with the purpose of accelerating an outcome or getting something you know that you want in return or something. Um, yeah, I, we are going to the nth level of detail on this, where uh, potentially we end up with byproduct CRM. So it's a byproduct of me being awesome at communicating. All of the admin disappears. Admin being adding the minimum amount of information to get me to the next stage in the sales cycle. Do you think that that's a that's it's, it was a side effect, or is it something that they consciously decided on in the beginning? Or is it yeah, just so it's not. Yeah, it's, it's not a. I'm I'm kind of sharing a bit of you know our vision of of where we're going. So that you know when we're talking to press and analysts at the moment, we're talking about this this notion that you know engagement data is the crude oil of sales and opportunity management now. It is um, when, when you can, a bit like, a, a, so I'll tell you a story. So in, in the Grand Prix, uh, the Grand Prix we just had, whether it's the Australian or the Hungarian Grand Prix, uh, they collect so much data from a Grand Prix car now that they're actually able to set the car up differently for every single corner of the course. So much so that if you try to drive it with the setup for corner one, round corner two, you wouldn't be able to drive it around it. The whole vehicle changes. It then also takes into account macro effects. So they're looking at the ocular response of the driver to see how tired they are and what their response rates are. And they'll delay the setup by milliseconds, taking into account uh, how tired the, the driver is. Well, that means that they're able to literally squeeze out every last piece of performance from it. Can you imagine a scenario where if something like, you know, in real time, you're analyzing the customer's tone, what they're saying, their sentiment, and reflecting that into how the salesperson is acting and reacting and proposing and stuff, you could literally just start to set the call up to allow the salesperson to be as good as they possibly can be within any given situation, which is mutually beneficial to both parties. I'm thinking straight away, I wish this call were three hours, not one hour. Because yeah. <laughs> if you think about what you're just, what you're just said is that yeah. 
in effect, that's the art part of selling, which is the ability of somebody in real time to make assessments at subconscious levels about responses, movement, background, context, all of those things, and adjust even subconsciously. And you're saying, okay, we can take some of that out of it in some sort of artificial intelligent it's called, it's format. Called, yeah, it's called human in the loop. So uh, you'll never replace humans in the sales process. And I would uh, advocate against that strongly. There is a level of rapport. People still buy from people. Mm -hmm. But you know what? I'd, I'd love to have a phenomenal buying experience. And if that can be augmented and supported and enhanced, um, then I'm all for that. Cool. Uh, because that's for everybody's benefit. Yeah. And that's the direction that we're going in. Yeah. Right. So uh, what, the time we have left, guys, I wanted to get through as many questions as I can. Uh, some great site, by the way, a great insight, guys. Thank you very much. Great way to put it, capturing the customer's voice. Uh, so here's one. Uh, this is more, I guess, to do with other markets. So are either of you using Gong outside of the UK and Ireland? I don't mean selling to customers across Europe from UK and Ireland. I mean calls originating from, say, Germany or Amsterdam, where they have workers' councils input. So, I, Killian, do you have anything to insight on that? I mean, our, our salespeople in Europe are all based in UK and Ireland. So we don't have um, anybody based in Germany or Amsterdam. Okay, Tom, Tom do you? know where the question's yeah. coming I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I am um, I'm not an expert in conversational intelligence in terms of that regard. From a, from a legal standpoint, you're covered on GDPR. There's functionality across all recording platforms to be able to support that. Coming from those countries, normally uh, the reaction is they don't want to be able to see somebody's performance uh, via a tool. And it should be hidden from the company unless it's offered up by the individual. Uh, I have to say, again, slightly accelerated through COVID, uh, that actually the vehement kind of rejection of any technology like this by various workers' councils in Germany in particular, rather than uh, rather than Amsterdam, I haven't heard of it come from there so much, uh, is is dissipating. Because, you know, as Killian's just been, you know, explaining, and I've been trying to explain as well, this isn't the old, like, we're looking for ways to beat you up. This is actually, we're looking at ways to build you up. And um, through helping you uh, to relive your moments, and um, and in my experience, people clamber for that. And so that's getting through the workers' councils a lot quicker. Okay, interesting. Uh, question from Kevin. Uh, and this is for you, Tom. It says, would you mind sharing an example of what your scorecard looks like, especially the rubric of answers the score can select to get away from the I feel component? Uh, yeah, after this call, Paul, I will uh, send you over a couple of screenshots. Okay. Uh, they're nothing. They're nothing amazing, uh, but uh, yeah, happy to share them. Okay, cool. Uh, uh, it's one for Killian says, "Brilliant that your reps are your podcast." <laughs> <laughs> Enjoy the company every morning. Yeah. Uh, okay, I I have to read this one. I'm I don't understand it just yet, so uh, you may see a blank look once I've finished reading it. It's for it's at both of you. Uh, curious if Revenue Collective has supported your lockdown usage and practices related to Gong. I, I don't know what that means. Do, do you? Do you? So the Revenue Collective is a uh, is a is a, an, a think tank of about two and a half thousand CROs and VPs of sales around the world uh, now, and there is a there's a chapter in London. I'm not sure whether we whether there is one in Ireland. Just check, William. Maybe you'll set that up. Sure. Um, Okay. Yeah, there is like there a is a lot of body. Yeah, there's a lot of um, just people who are passionate about selling and uh, and improving the professionalism of it. Uh, yeah, so there's been a lot of dialogue uh, in the revenue collective, a lot of support across the group in terms of you know which which ones are these conversational intelligence to tools to look at. You know, we're kind of focused on Gong today. There are many others. Uh, they have you know different nuances and capabilities around them. And uh, and how to use those, how to onboard people remotely. Yeah, all the stuff we've been talking about today. Okay, uh, another question. Wondering how often you have your team critique each other's calls and how did you get that type of culture started? Killian, could start with you on that one, please. Yeah, I mean, it's... 
I think one of the things we really focus the value in the company is being vulnerable. Uh, and from vulnerability comes greatness. So um, it's, it's been relatively easy to do it. Um, I mean, it's, it's a company-wide uh, initiative in terms of all our sales teams across the world. Uh, so, you know, it's from, from, from when you start your listing to other people's calls. So it's not like there's a change process. Um, I found that, um, you know, when we did the peer-to-peer -peer coaching um, as a group, as opposed to just one-to-one, -one, uh, it was a little bit painful initially. Uh, for people, but I think everybody was involved in it, um, and I think hearing multiple feedbacks, positive and constructive, from your peers is is very very helpful. Uh, I've found actually my most senior and most experienced people have probably been the best advocates for using it as a coaching tool because they've really said, "Look, I mean, they regularly come and say, look, I'm having this challenge. Here's my call. Tell me what you think. You know, what could I do better?'" And I think when you've got senior people doing that, the the younger people are really or who look up to those people already are saying this is cool yeah. um, so it's just it's now part of our culture it's not didn't really have there was no major challenge to make it happen yeah okay good uh, same question for you Tom but also I noticed you're looking at some of the questions that are coming in and I wanted to ask if there was something a question you saw there that jumped out that you'd like to answer you think we haven't addressed yet that's important I, know, I think you're doing a great job Paul um, in terms of uh, looking at uh, and getting people responding to calls. Uh, there is within the stats side of Gong, uh, I can see the uh, the number of calls that people have listened to and not just listened to, but the number of calls they've actually coached. In other words, they've filled out a scorecard or made comments on. Um, and uh, I just put that up on a weekly basis. It's an old adage. Uh, you can only expect what you expect. And the fact that I'm sharing that on a regular basis, I also have a phenomenal uh, leader of the SDR team in Caitlin, and she's just been very good at kind of espousing this, this desire to help everybody get great. Yeah. Killian, have you noticed how good Tom is at stroking people? He's, he's, he's very good. Near, almost as good as you, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> Look. I, I was just set that one up for you. Uh, there's a quite, there's a, Stephen here from John as well. He said, "Is this a now? You've answered this one already. I just for completeness. Is this sales monitoring process uh, or a method of making sales staff better at what they do? I think that's a we we, we answered that one. Or as you said it succinctly. It's not about beating them up. It's about building them up, which I think mm. is a great takeaway for anybody looking at this. Uh, what else we got? There was, oh, there was a question about um, GDPR issues with that." Personally, I think if there were, there wouldn't be a business there, but I don't know if you have any insight on that. We do have one currently, which I know is gone. We're in the process of addressing. Um, so one of the capabilities that the tool has is around deals and deal management uh, in terms of pipeline. And one of the areas that we can choose in Europe is include email exchanges with customers. We're only showing to call engagements. Uh, now that's for GDPR reasons. Okay. Um, there's a few things about Europe RC here as well. Is there a LinkedIn group for it? Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't even. What is Europe RC? Revenue Collective. Oh, okay, so Revenue Collective. Yeah, just go yeah. to revenuecollective.com. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think there's some of these can be answered with uh, Dr. Google. Uh, guys, I think I'm going to disappoint everybody right now because it is four o'clock, and we said we were going to run for an hour. So I want to respect your time. Um, I, I, all I can say is on behalf of anybody listening is it's been incredibly insightful, guys. Uh, it's been a wonderful contribution to the, the, the debate about Gong. I, I, my takeaway from this is that it is uh, indispensable. In fact, it was quite interesting. I noticed when I, when I first saw you guys, Killian, doing it, I went to Sandler in the States and I said, you guys have got to see this. And they said, Paul, you're already too late. We're, we're partnering with Gong. Not just that, but when we now have a, uh, a corporate contract, we just roll Gong into it because we want not just the insights, but we want the ability to manage the process of changing that behavior and building people up, which is what we do. Um, so uh, I, 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 I don't think that's even a debate. But uh, I, as I said, if I disappoint anybody because we haven't got to every single question, I don't think I've seen as many questions ever, ever on a webinar come in. Uh, and that's kudos to you guys. So thank you very much for your time. It's really, really appreciated. Thanks, Paul. Enjoy the rest of your day. Again, Tom. See you. All, All right. right. See you. Bye -bye. Cheers. Bye.